Hey, welcome to Case of the Week, Retroperitoneal Fibrosis. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. Let's take a look at the case and then I'll review some learning points. So we'll start with this sagittal view of the abdominal aorta and notice how there's this eccentric hypoechoic area anteriorly. When we add power Doppler, this flow throughout the aortic lumen, but not in this region. And then what are these structures? Well, here's the celiac axis and then this is the superior mesenteric artery coming off anteriorly. Again, here we see that there's no flow and this area is fairly homogeneous and confluent. On this transverse image, we can see the spine here, and then there's the aortic lumen. This curvilinear echogenicity corresponds to calcified plaque about the aorta. And then here we see that peripheral hypoechoic area along the anterior aspect of the aorta. Part of it extends posteriorly, but the bulk of it is anterior and lateral. So you might think, well, could this just be some eccentric non-calcified plaque, some mural thrombus within an ectatic abdominal aorta? And that's a good thought, but I wouldn't bring you all the way to radiologist headquarters to just show you atherosclerotic plaque, would I? <laughs> but no, this was actually new from three years ago, which would be a little unusual for that degree of atherosclerosis to develop. Let's look at the patient's CT scan. So this was done with intravenous and oral contrast. Here we are at the level of the liver, left kidney, left adrenal gland, and the spleen. As I move inferiorly, here's the normal inferior vena cava and the normal aorta. And then now you start to see this irregular hypodense soft tissue along the anterior aspect of the aorta extending laterally. It looks fairly confluent. And notice how the inferior vena cava now is getting partially tethered. We're seeing an abnormal configuration to the normal contour of the IVC, and that's due to this tethering. Here you can see very nicely how the soft tissue is anterior to the aorta and tethers that IVC. Notice though how it does not extend significantly posterior to the aorta. It's not displacing the aorta off the spine. Something else you want to look at are the ureters when you're evaluating retroperitoneal fibrosis. Here's the left ureter as I'm moving in fairly. You can see it abuts and is likely adhesed to the surface of this retroperitoneal fibrosis, but it's not really obstructed. We don't see any hydronephrosis other than some mild fullness. The right ureter, we can see here, it abuts the inferior vena cava, but doesn't get involved by the retroperitoneal fibrosis. Also, the fibrosis extends along the aorta, partially along the anterior aspect of the common iliac arteries here. And then we see it fade away in just normal iliac vasculature distally. Now, since we're talking about the retroperitoneum, I should mention the normal retroperitoneal structures. That would include the kidneys, the pancreas, except for the pancreatic tail, also the adrenal glands, the aorta, and the inferior vena cava, as well as the renal vessels, and then also the descending and ascending colon, as well as the second and third portions of the duodenum. Those are all retroperitoneum, as well as the middle third of the rectum. Now, looking at the coronal imaging, here's the liver and the pancreas. There we're seeing the superior mesenteric vein. Here we can see, again, that confluent hypodense soft tissue indicating retroperitoneal fibrosis about the aorta. And again, notice how it's partially encasing the inferior vena cava there. Now, let's look at some key points for retroperitoneal fibrosis, which you can also find in the episode show notes. So most of these are idiopathic, 70%, meaning we don't really know what causes it. And that's sometimes described as Orman disease. There are some known causes as well, like certain medications, malignancy, infection, patients who've had previous radiation or retroperitoneal hemorrhage, and even asbestos exposure can increase your risk. But most cases, we don't know what causes it. And the symptoms are also somewhat nonspecific. So if there are any, patients might just have malaise, weight loss, some low-grade fever. You see more significant symptoms if ureteral entrapment occurs, and that can lead to obstructive uropathy and even renal failure. And classically, you'll see medial deviation of the middle third of the ureters causing hydronephrosis, which we do not have in this case. When the venous entrapment progresses, that can lead to lower extremity edema, even pelvic and scrotal edema, and deep venous thrombosis can occur as well. On CT, you'll typically see a soft tissue mass anterolateral to the aorta with this posterior sparing, and that's very helpful to differentiate from the main differential for retroperitoneal fibrosis, which is retroperitoneal lymphoma. And that tends to be a little more bulky and will also extend posterior to the aorta and will displace it anteriorly. So you can remember it, lymphoma will lift the aorta. On MRI, typically when the disease is inactive, it will look like fibrous tissue. So it will be low T1 and low T2 signal. But when it's actively inflamed, it will be T2 bright with heterogeneous early enhancement. On PET-CT, when you have metabolically active areas, those will be avid, and that can actually aid in identifying appropriate biopsy sites. So due to a clinical suspicion of neoplasm in this case, the patient did undergo biopsy, which yielded idiopathic retroperitoneal fibrosis. All right, thank you for joining me. And if you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, remember, radiology is life.